was always a, a saying when I was a young girl, older might not be beautiful, but at least it's friendly. This is my roots. I love it. I love the people here. I love everything about Old Inman. Having been brought up in Oldham, you get to know the town and love the town, and know the people and love the people. Uh, they're blunt, they're helpful, and they're honest. Genuine people, I think. When you've got a friend, you've really got a friend. You know, they'll stick with you by thick and thin. Mind you, there were two ways in Oldham, rough or smooth, and you had your pick. Fifty years ago, this small Lancashire town in the country was almost totally given over to the production of cotton, with its hundreds of mills and textile machinery works. True, it already had something of a reputation as a hat-making town, but at the end of the 19th century, Oldham was world famous. Behind every success story inevitably are people, and here there was no shortage of willing hands and strong hearts to keep the mill wheels turning. It was said that this country's bread hung on the cotton threads of Oldham, and indeed there was some truth in that dramatic and rather romantic notion. Everyone, it seemed, men, women and even children, worked in some way in the textile industry, and today every Oldhamer has a story to tell about those days. Oh, my father were a minder. He was what they call an operative cotton spinner, and you could put cotton in his fingers and he'd tell you what weft and what count. Now, what conveyed nothing to me, but he can tell you the quality of the cotton, and they were very really clever men. And he were a minder, and he were in charge of a purr in the Ginny Gate in the mill. He, and he used to work in his bare feet, because I remember at times, my mother used to have to cut spells out. <laughs> They were bobbins, what we had, uh, a bobbin from, well, they weren't cops, they were bobbins, and they used to come up from the ring room. They'd go from the car room to the ring room, and then up to the winding room, and we used to put these on. They were small, narrow things, and we got them on bigger bobbins, what went round that way. We had knotters on your hand, and they knotted, and then they went to, to the beamers, and then the beamers went to, to the weavers. Uh, and that was how the cloth was made. It was hot. hot. Yes. Oh, it you was. sweat, didn't you? Yes, you really yes. sweat, you know. Yeah. You felt like a a dishcloth, didn't you? When in you the summer. Up. Yeah. It you know, terrible. it was worse in the summer. Yeah. We used to wear clogs, <laughs> but when we got to work, we used to change them into a pair of shoes. You see, you couldn't walk about in clogs; you'd slip all over that. Yeah, shoe. because it was oily on the on the floors, you know, but, like. Uh, very noisy. And then, you see, if you want a person, you've got to go, you! <laughs> you see, you used to speak like that, lip read. And uh, they, everyone knew what you were talking about, you know. Well, you they all did it, didn't they? They yes. got used to it. I enjoyed it, every bit of it, really, because there were a lovely atmosphere, shall I say. Uh, you all help one another. Now, if there was a girl in our, our frame, she hadn't good health, and she would, couldn't afford to not go to work, and they'd uh, all help her to keep going, keep her, what we call her bobbins going, and so she wouldn't lose any wage because they weren't too well off them days if they didn't get any work. If they didn't do their work, they didn't get the money. Well, we had happy times. They were, they were everybody work. used to join in, didn't yeah. they? You know, and uh, at Christmas it used to be lovely. We used to chase after the men, you know, with the mistletoe. <laughs> <laughs>
There's always been a market of sorts in the town centre, and Tommyfield, the open market, is the oldest. Named after Thomas Whitaker, who once farmed this area, it was more than simply a place to shop. It was a centre of working-class Oldham's life. For Walter Colton and his daughter Marjorie, Tommyfield has special significance. My father stood at back of the stall, them stalls, he stood at back of the stall. Ladies and gentlemen, now then what I'm going to do today, I'm going to give you a special turn up. It's going to be good, this. The best Cadbury's, Terry's, Round Trees, Fries, all of them, they're good. I want you to listen, first of all. I want to do the talking, and then we'll do the selling. Well, originally, um, my grandparents, they had a just one trestle. It was one board on legs. Um, and then they, they finished up where they had a full square, and they stood in the middle um, with just a canopy over the top. Um, but the one I remember most is but we weren't, we weren't really grand. We had a, a lean-to stall. It leaned on to the inside market. Um, and that's, that's the one I remember mostly, because that's where my childhood was. Um, before my parents, um, before I went to school, that's where I played. They used to have skips. They were a, quite a tall basket. and. My mother used to put me in this to sleep. I used to sleep in the middle of the stall in the skip. So I, I can remember that quite vividly through all sorts of weathers. The whole market area was huge and included a permanent fairground. So while their parents shopped, Tommy Field provided entertainment for the young Oldemer. Vera Smith, known affectionately as Dobby Vera, runs the last reminder of that fairground. There used to be three sets of roundabouts, uh, Grinelli's ice cream cart, um, two sets of swing boats. Then in the winter months, marshals used to come over the tops from Yorkshire and we used to have a winter fair on there. If you imagine Little Woods now, well, that's what the green was. That's where I was born. Um, I was fourth in line. The other three was born on Oldham Market. It was a case then you had to do the family business. It weren't a, I don't want to go on, I want to go out with the girls. You had to work with the family. Because my mum was, my mum was a temp all at that time. But we didn't realise we were out poorly. And she died when I was 15. But uh, me and my father, and Ro Rose had the swings, the swings at the back of the roundabouts on the green. But we also had a set of roundabouts on Oldham Market. You had to pull your weight. In them days, you started work when you were 14, in the mill. I say, uh, later on, when, when I was courting to get extra money, I went six, well, ten in the mill at night, five nights a week. And then when I was old enough, I went to, as a barmaid. Well, there's one stall that I liked, and I can't remember the lady's name, but she was a, it was a haberdashery type stall. And I thought that was wonderful. She had all these different types of ribbons and, and lace and buttons. And she used to have this magnificent hairdo that um, she looked a bit like Lily Savage, I think, <laughs> when I think about it now. <laughs> there used to be an awful lot of hair <laughs> and the longest nails I'd ever seen. But on October the 5th, 1974, a terrible fire gutted the indoor Victoria Market. Odomers woke up to the news on Saturday morning that the place which had played such an important part in their lives was completely destroyed. You see, the market was my family. And so that when it disappeared, it was, I don't know, it's like somebody who just took the heart out of it. And people were wandering around absolutely lost because it had been the focus of their lives. I don't, I don't know how to describe it. It was just as if somebody had cut off the right arm, because they were lost. Marjorie's childhood memories were centred on the market because that had been her playground. But for other children left to their own devices, there was a whole world of imagination and simple enjoyment outside the town and in the streets. Well, you've got this row of six houses, all with coal places and toilets. Yeah, there used to be the coal place at one side, the toilet at the other, a back gate in between. 
and we used to start at the top of the row and run the whole way down the row from the roof to roof, you know. <laughs> and the neighbours saw us flashing past, and of course that, that didn't please them, you know. We had a street corner, actually, uh, further up the, the, the road, and, and of course a lot of kids around there. We formed a big, you know, we all played together. And we used to meet under the lamp. There was a lamp post there, a gas lamp. And uh, we more or less grew up under this lamp, you know, because we were still meeting when we were teenagers, I think, when we left school in the same place. But on the corner, there was a chip shop, and it had uh, a wall jutting out, which came down in three stages like that. And we used to play a game where uh, the bravest ones amongst us would see which one we could jump off, the top one or the bottom one. And I mean, obviously, the younger ones could only do the bottom one. But as you got older, you went, you moved up to the next one. And then older still, you moved on to the big one. And then you consider you'd grown up, <laughs> you know. Now, my first recollection as a lad was, was I mean, so there was about 365 cotton mills or allied trades in Oldham. And there was no canteens in the mills then. There were no canteens. So I used to run dinners, and a lot of lads used to run dinners. And what it was, they'd uh, perhaps make a potato pie in a, in a basin, and then put a saucer on top, and on top of that they put a bit of fatty cake, which was uh, really, it was the pastry, for the, it was the crust for the pie. Sometimes, if you were lucky, you'd get some currant fatty cake, but I used to help myself to the currants on the way down to the mills. Now then, now these dinners have been a red and white handkerchief. They were always in a red and white, anybody took their red and white handkerchief. And of course, so you had this basin, saucer, fatty cake, red and white handkerchief tied so you could hold them. So I had one each in each hand. Well, being a lad, you're running, Right, right, and they're always on the corner at the table. And I'd grab them, and I'd set off as fast as sparks could go off my clogs. And the last words, he, she used to stick her head out the door, and I, by then I must have gone about 20 or 30 yards, and she used to say, I don't spill gravy! We played at Film Stars, which was, sounds terribly corny, but um, we did. And uh, I can remember clearly with friends of ours and lived next door to my grandma. And we used to pretend that Errol Flynn had rung us. <laughs> and um, Terry Grant was going to call and pick us up to take us out to dinner that night. You know, that sort of corny thing that people do, children do play. Um, we played um, lots of games that involved having no traffic around. And we used to think it was quite disgraceful that the traffic came down the road and we had to get it onto the Sideway, you know, we, we we played skipping, and and you can still remember everything that you, you did. You know, you can still remember the games you played. And you can remember the games, the ball games you played, and the the verses that that you you remembered playing with the balls against the wall. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Jews, bought his wife a pair of shoes, and that sort of thing. It's always there. You always remember it. When I was a little lad. Uh, we moved to Shaw, and I remember it early in the morning, it must have been about six o'clock, I, I, some of these cotton mill workers will tell you better than me, and uh, I used to hear the factory hooters going. Well, I, I think in Shaw we had either 25 or 28 mills, and most of them had a hooter, and they all had a different sound, and they'd go, that was to waken up the, uh, well, the workers. And then, you then I remember quite well the clatter of clogs going down the street, and of course they were cobbled streets then. They were cobbled streets up to the late fifties, you know. Odyssey Road was cobbled well into the fifties. So consequently, I understand that each mill had its own sound, and therefore, people it, it was like music in the morning. I remember being carried by my father. And he had his medals on. He was going to the uh, Remembrance Day parade, and uh, we were going to the um, what War Memorial in Oldham on Yorkshire Street. 
And it's after that, I always thought that as I grew up, I always thought when anybody mentioned the war, I always thought it was fought around a memorial. I just associated that with the war, you know, because that was all I knew about it, obviously. For the young, over many generations, Whit Friday has always had a special significance. This was the day to put on that new white dress or shirt, and no matter what denomination, to walk the streets proudly in procession behind the church's banner and with brass bands to keep up the pace. Every child who was old enough to walk, it seemed, took part. Whit Friday was absolutely marvellous. We started off from church and it used to be turns. First of all, one year it would be the Catholics who would take the first time to walk, and then it would be the Church of England. The Salvation Army used to join on the Methodists. One long possession, it used to be th three hours. All the girls were in white and white veils um, and carried croups when I was younger. Um, I remember my eldest sis two eldest sisters having croups, but I didn't, I just had a basket with flowers in and uh, the bands, because every church had a band. You'd be beautiful. All the children, little children, were in white, and then there'd probably be uh, a rose queen and all her retinue. You'd be follow on. You'd be really a long procession. You'd be marvellous. And <coughs> then uh, later on, when all the Protestants had walked, the Catholics used to walk afterwards, and they used to walk. There used to be hundreds and hundreds of them. It used to be lovely, all in different coloured dresses, you know. It used to be lovely. And then after we walked, you see, everybody used to disperse, and we used to go to what they call, uh, we used to Fields. hire a field. And we used to go and have coffee and bun. Yeah. You stay there all day, yes, didn't you? Play night. games and, uh, yeah. until. Uh, about seven o'clock at night, and then we used to all come home. That was Whit Friday. We, we used to look yes. forward to Whit Friday. Yeah. It was a mother and father's day out light, you know, <laughs> weren't it? Yes. Really? Yes. It was yes. good. Other happy days are in store when once a year every mill and factory shut up shop for the summer holidays. It was Oldham Wakes Week. The place to go for fresh air and fun was Blackpool. And never mind the weather, you were here to enjoy yourself. Properly dressed, of course. All them weeks, we used to have a, a week. In uh, August, it used to be August. Yeah, end of August. Yes. And uh, we used to have a week holiday. If you could afford it, you could go away. If you couldn't, well, you stayed at home. Well, if you did yeah. go away for a week, you, you couldn't book into the hotel like they do now, because you couldn't afford it. So you used to... Uh, the landlady would... Uh, you get your own food and she would uh, cook it for you. We always went to Blackpool, yes. And Scarborough, we went to Scarborough as well. We used to go the same hours when we were little, when my mother used to take us. But um, the, you'd go out and you'd get your veg and uh, your potatoes and your meat if you, well, uh, we used to have the chops as well, you know. And she'd cook anything like that and uh, rice pudding she'd make for us as well, you know, and if we wanted a pastry, uh, we used to tell her. She used to, we didn't used to get flour or anything like that, she provided that and we paid her and then she'd tell us how much it would be and add it on our bill for her and then we paid at, week, at the weekend, you know. I was 12 when I first went to Blackpool. I think it was one at six uh, on, the, on the train then. I mean, late, later days than that, it was half a crown on the train, and that was admittance to Blackpool Tower as well. 
home again, holidays were quickly forgotten and you soon fell back into the daily routines of life. Every family seemed to be a large one and there were no mod cons to make things easy in those small back-to-back -back terraced houses. Central heating, carpeted floors and inside toilets were unheard of, but somehow it wasn't a problem. What you didn't have, you didn't miss. It was the same for everybody. You just accepted the way of life. I mean, looking back now, I wouldn't like to go back to it, obviously. I mean, having a bath on a Friday night in a tin bath in front of the fire, you know. And we had these, uh, these old Victorian cooking ranges, you know, which were all... <clears throat> they had a... In one side, there was an oven. You had the fire in the middle. The other side, there was a boiler with a lid. So you'd get your hot water in the boiler and do your cooking in the oven. And, uh, you know, it was a case of the tin bath in front of the fire and a, 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 a bucket or something, get the water out of the boiler and pour it in the bath. We had a big bath and it was hung in the back yard, out in the yard. And then we used to bring, and we had a set boiler in, in what Mother used for washing. And that was what you used for your bath. You used a gas set boiler. And when we don't, had all our adverse, Father made a, a wood board and it was covered in and you couldn't see the boiler. Like It made it a bit private, like, you know, in the kitchen. Because there were good big kitchens and good big houses, but you had no bathroom. You see, nobody, it was funny because with younger children, they, they wouldn't come in the kitchen while you were, nobody knew you. It were a rule in that, yeah. We used to have it in the kitchen as we got older, but when we were younger, we always used to carry the bath in. Oliver and I, my older sister, we'd carry it, fill it and carry it in and have it on the hearth because you've got your fire there, you know. And uh, it's funny how you manage, you wonder how you managed. I don't know how we did really, but we did. And we had to have a bath every week. <laughs> I think with 11 cinemas and three theatres, saw Gracie Fields in Oldham and uh, Betty Driver years ago and years ago. There were some marvellous shows. Uh, there were cinemas where we used to go, Saturday dinner time, penny to go in. One was near the bus station, is now it was called the uh, Picture Drum. And I remember singing in the, they had a singing competition. And I sung one of my dad's old, The Moon Shines Bright on Charlie Chaplin. This shoes are cracking for the wonderful black in me. And I won first prize because I took all my mates from round here and I got the biggest cheer. 12 toffee apples, which they all scoffed up. With five places of entertainment in Old London, it began with the letter T, with Tempire, Thordian, Third BC, the Electrosium and Thimperial. <laughs> then in September 1939, Oldham, like everywhere else in the UK, braced itself for what lay ahead and prepared for the worst. No one really knew quite what to expect. It was a time when everyone felt they had to do their bit for their hometown and the country. My father had signed on. He tried to join the army again, you know, although he'd fought in the First World War. But they said he was too old, so he became an air raid warden. On this particular night, he was on duty. And uh, the sirens had gone. And I remember it was a moonlit night, and we were down the cellar. And there's a little window at ground level in those cellars, you know. And it was so quiet, I heard the back gate open, and you could hear his footsteps coming down the backyard, you know, and then he came in and shouted down the cellar, he wanted to come out and have a look at this. He said, it's like daylight. And it was the night that they bombed the Belgian mill at Royton. I think what had happened, the pathfinders came over first and dropped flares, which lit, lit up the whole countryside for miles. So we all trooped outside to look at this. How lie you said you could read a newspaper. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, the, the rescue of the bombers came over then, and then it, it, it got quite nasty, you know, because you could hear the bombs screaming down, you know, and that's the first time I'd heard I'd been that close to one. And the floor jumped up and down, you know. But we were digging bombs up 
for five years and then I went to clearing minefields up on the sea coast. And then I did six months training as a frogman, ready to go to Japan. Japan hadn't capitulated then, but the two atom bombs saved me bacon, so I didn't have to go. And, you, know, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki attended the war before I got there. But bomb disposal, the pretty horrible because it, if you're abroad, you expect you're being killed or something, but, but on your own ground, you know. I mean, the second bomb I went on went off, and it was a 2,000 pounder. And I'd, uh, the officer said that pull it up, a lorry and shear legs crane, pull it up, and it wouldn't budge on the side, and it said, take another foot of earth on it. The bomb had stopped in the man's garden, upright, only about 10 foot down. So I went in and I took another foot of earth on so the, the rope would pull it out easier. And then the sergeant said, go and brew up. People left the doors empty. They were all evacuated, you know, for depending on a big bomb, bigger evacuation. And I went into this house and I just heard them shout, right, take it away, meaning the lorry to pull the bomb up. And it went off. Ooh, I had pots, pans with a lot around me, you know, and I didn't know what to find, obviously, when I got outside. I think there were about three of us left out of it. We had a bomb on the long green lane. Right in the middle of the lane, and there were six houses all went into the crater. Mine was one of them. I was collecting my husband's insurance book at the time, so a friend said, come down to my house and I'll give you a lift. Suddenly the sirens went, and we'd had a lot of uh, sirens that week previously, but they'd all been false alarms, you see, so we didn't bother, we just carried on. And then suddenly there was this awful whoosh, and everything went quiet for a minute, and then boo. And we realised, of course, that it had been a bomb. So when it quieted down, I went out, I was a first aider, and I went out onto Incline Road to see if there was anything I could do, and the whole place was lit up with a blaze. And the air raid wardens were there, and one of them came and said, what are you looking for? So I said, well, I'm a first aider, and I was wondering if there was anything I could do to help. He said, I'm sorry, love, it's beyond your means, this. You get back under cover. So I did. And whilst I was going back to my friend's house, the air raid wardens came up the avenue. Is there anyone here from the garden suburb? So I said, yes, I accepted that. We went into my friend's house, started packing her clothes and her babies in the pram to come up here where it was safe. And a friend of ours came to say that our house had gone and I was supposed to be dead. They just pulled a body out. <laughs> and as I walked into the house next door, all the windows, of course, had gone all the way around here. I walked in, the old ladies from next door were there, my parents. And as I walked through the door, they all turned and I said, Oh, you're alive! <laughs> yeah, 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 I remember prisoners yeah. of war. There was a uh, <coughs> stationed at the oil mill down near the shore, and they got them building a, a, a foundation to put um, these prefabs that people lived in after light. There was some also up at the Glen Mill. Yeah. Yes, there was. I up think they were. I think and they it, were more Italian, weren't they up there? Well, I don't know. I think they were German because it was from the Glen Mill that these used to come to visit these people in the same street where I lived, just a few doors from me, and uh, they used to come on a Sunday and get Sunday lunch. And you see, during that, they got very friendly. And after the war, it still carried on. And uh, they used to go over to Germany, and they used to come over to England. <laughs> they kept in touch, did they, like? Yes, yeah. yes. Then in 1945, it was all over. And the whole country, it seemed, celebrated with one enormous street party. Every table and chair was brought out. And despite the desperate shortage of supplies, somehow everyone managed to scrape together enough coupons to have a great time. But while most men were getting out of uniform, one man was just stepping into his. 
when I joined the police, I joined in 1947, and I, came, I joined Bradford City, but I transferred to Oldham in February 1948. And I worked on the beat. Then uh, most people worked on the beat, on traffic or CID. The police admin was policemen, and they were very good, very good. And they used to work uh, long hours. But I was a beat policeman, and I was first sent to town field. There was no communication. Once the policeman left the police station, he was on his own. He stood on his own two feet. You see, he couldn't shout for help because he had to rely on the goodness of people. And, and they were good. There's no doubt about it. There's no wrong with all of us. And, uh, of course, you got the knocker up, you see, and he, the knocker up, everybody, you know, they couldn't... They, they couldn't get up if the, 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 the knocker up didn't knock them up. And he had a long stick with three wires on, three long wires on, and he'd put it up to the house, rest it on the window bottom, and knock it, and it'd bump, bump. You could hear it all. You could hear it for a knocker up. You could hear them all over. There were more than one knocker up, you know. And he'd shout, right, and he'd shout, right. Now, I remember one lad that used to come up on his field road. He was a quiet chap, never had a lot to say. But there were eyes for the police, you know. There's two fellas down there, is it? Oh. There were eyes. Now then, this lad, he used to have two caps. And he had a cap with a neb at the front and a cap with a neb at the back. And of course, when he got it to you, he said, Are they coming or going? Now then, on a Saturday night, Oldham was a mecca because it used to draw them in when they'd been to a football match or a rugby match. They would come into Oldham because they were allowed, it's, they were allowed music and costume in the pubs. They all had a singing room, especially in the top, in the top of the town. And of course they used to go for a night out in the pub because they had this music in the pubs, you see. The loads of dance halls, you know, that just, that's very popular. Uh, particularly on Saturday nights, there was the Savoy, which is uh, the Candlelight Club now. The big dance was always on a Friday night at the Hill Stores Ballroom, which was big. People used to come quite long distances, you know. And they had the trams then. I still remember all these girls getting off the trams, you know, with the long dresses, they used to wear long dresses. And quite often it'd be raining, you know, the streets were muddy and the dresses would be trailing in the mud. And they got their little parcel under their arms with their dance shoes in, you know. And that was the big event. Friday night we used to go to the uh, dance hall, either Majestic or uh, Billington's. I used to have to go to Billington's because uh, my mum had passed on then and my dad insisted and he always used to be waiting for me at 11 o'clock <laughs> to make sure I'd been to Billington's. So if I'd been to Majestic or King Street stores, I used to have to leave early to get back to, to Billington's so that my dad would think I'd come out with all the rest of them. <laughs> Mr and Mrs Billington kept a tight rein on things. There was no alcohol. Billington's was on Ascroft Street, and um, I think most young people started off dancing there right in the centre of the town actually, very, very busy. And they had two floors, the ground floor, and I've never been in the ground floor. Upstairs were considered a bit posher, so I don't know how I ever landed there first, but we did. It was upstairs, you went dancing. Large mirror, which all the girls congregated in front of, posing about with hair and lipstick. But it was a lovely atmosphere, and everybody seemed, you seemed to know everybody. Um, there was no real sense of adventure, you know, just, very comfortable, just very nice. Now the girls were not allowed out in the interval, Billington. The boys were allowed out, but where they went. Um, and they probably had a couple of pints and that was it really. They'd be drunk then, wouldn't they? But um, the girls weren't allowed out at Billington, no pass outs for girls. So it was quite proper. Ah yes. Those were the days when you actually went to ballroom dancing lessons too. And many apparently came here to Billington's, still holding its head high in the town centre, while all around seemed to be losing theirs. Perhaps it's all down to the indomitable Mrs B. 
there was only in those days four dances. That's all we had to teach. Waltz, foxtrot, quickstep, and tango. And we used to run a full night of four dances. I often wonder how we did it, you know. But everybody learned. They learned the waltz first, then they learned the quickstep, the foxtrot next, and then the tango. That was the last one. Um, when we had a class, all the boys used to sit on one side and all the girls on the other. And as soon as they saw you were going to start teaching, there was a mad rush across this floor <laughs> for the nicest looking girl, not for the one that could dance. <laughs> The barn dance, it was absolutely famous. It used to run for one hour without stopping. And then after the interval, they'd have it again. <laughs> it was a case of boy meet girl, really. So if they met a girl in here, they might take her own. But the week after, they might take another one. And when they eventually found one they liked, they courted her. They actually courted a girl. And which is much different, isn't it, to what they do today? Well, if I'm in before anybody's in, I either walk, practice walking around this room or I dance solo. It's usually Foxtrot, my favourite dance. <laughs> You didn't just learn the steps at Billington's. You probably learnt there was a way to behave on the dance floor too, a sort of gentility that doesn't perhaps exist today. For dancing and that, um, it weren't, you couldn't refuse them. If they came up and asked you, you wouldn't be ignorant and say no. Uh, you used to get up and do it. You used to have one lad there where you used to always think, I'm, I'm forever blowing bubbles. And uh, it was hilarious. Uh, everybody used to clap him, and then he used to come around asking everybody for dances. But a bit, a bit on the slow side, but still you wouldn't refuse them. You didn't go on with anybody who you didn't really like. You might have had your eye on them for a few weeks, you know, so I quite felt quite like him, and you might have thought quite like her. Um, so you didn't go on with anybody you didn't like at all. There, was, there wasn't really the same casual arrangement that there is now. I don't think you would have ever go on with somebody you didn't know. That was quite unusual, if you did. So it was always somebody you knew, or somebody you knew of, or somebody you'd had your eye on for quite some time. And then you'd go home with them and sort of have a little bit of a, a smoochy session with them. But it was all very proper. It, I find it quite amazing now when I watch television, and they meet someone, and, and that's it. Next time you see them, they're in bed. and I find it quite amazing. I think we don't know them. <laughs> No. Me and my mate got two birds and they looked a bit scrubby and we thought we were in here and we took them to some hen pens behind Oldham Park in two doorways. And uh, I'd be, what, 17 and I didn't know anything at all about sex. I don't know. Now, I was trying to have what I call a cuddle and I heard the next doorway, this girl screamed and my mate had fainted. Oh, I was talking about the pickle I was in. I just slapped his tail. He come round after a while. I thought if that's our first adventure with a girl, and you have to faint. <laughs> it was jiving time. That was absolutely, I thought at the time, fantastic. I cringe now at the thought of it because I was a, a jiver <laughs> and moved along from corner to corner, you know, you just ignored it when he said, move along. And then you'd go to the next corner, you'd jive again. It was quite defiant, really. And um, there was a bloke who was a very good jiver as well, so he, I was very pleased when he used to come to ask me. And then there used to be as well something that was, um, I, think the, I don't think they do this now, but there used to be what they called excuse me. And uh, during the excuse me, um, Sometimes it was unfortunate because you might be dancing with somebody you quite fancied, but somebody would excuse you that. I mean, they'd tap the boy on the shoulder and uh, say, excuse me, and then they'd dance with you. And I remember somebody saying, it sounds awfully big-headed, but it, it was sort of a nice thing that happened to say, you've been excused 25 times in that dance. <laughs> well, I could jive. Yes, we could all jive. Um, 
It was finding someone to jive with. Usually it was girls jiving with girls because you didn't get many lads that would have a go. Some of them would. Uh, but I miss the era whereby they, you know, they used to have the, the long jackets. I can remember them. I can remember my brother having the long jacket and the, the brothel creepers. I don't know if you're allowed to say that. <laughs> um, and the hair slicked back with the, with the piece that came down and the brill cream. I can remember that. My time of dancing was um, very full dresses, a bit like... Audrey Hepburn, very full skirt, and at least, at least five petticoats, very full petticoats. And that was lovely when you were dancing because you used to twist round and thing. I think I was a bit of a poser, actually. <laughs> I did have a, a skirt that I used to, um, we used to have, it looked like a lampshade, and we used to um, make it stiff with sugar. I can remember my mother showing me how to make this starch with, with sugar and it used to be so stiff it used to scratch all your legs and ladder your stockings. Stockings were a, a premium. They were one and three from Woolworths. There used to be a man at Frogger's that just stand at the top of the stairs to make sure that people, the girls had dresses on. Frocks as he called them. They had to wear frocks and they hadn't to wear skirts, blouses, no separates, no suits. And a friend of mine stitch, spent all the Friday night stitching her top to her bottom because she knew he'd pull the skirt and see if it came apart. And they wouldn't let them in, you know, if, um, if they weren't in a dress. In the late 50s, the dark streets and smoking chimneys of Oldham were taken for granted. It was all part of the industrial landscape of a successful cotton town. But for a young Cockney actor arriving here for the first time, it was a terrible shock. I remember getting off a train at Manchester and I've never seen such filth, I, I couldn't believe it. And I didn't know, I knew I was going to Oldham. So I went to the box office gentleman and said, you know, I want to go to Oldham. And he, and he said, whereabouts are you going to? And I thought, well, he'll, he'll never know Oldham Rep, but I, I, I don't know where else I'm going. And I actually said, well, I'm going to Oldham Rep. And he said, ah, oh, you want mumps. And you know, what? I said, but what? He said, you want mumps? And I said, well, no, I want Oldham. What is Oldham? Mum what is mumps? And he said, well, it, it, it's, it's a station. You go to mumps, and then you get out, and you walk up the hill, and you'll find the rep. It was the end of October. It was, I suppose, probably about five o'clock at night. But it was, I got off the train at mumps in darkness. And then it was at the end of the cobbled street with gaslight and it was unbelievable, and up a slight incline. And I walked up this street, and of course it was raining. I mean, everybody had joked in the south that Oldham rained, and Manchester was always raining, and it was raining, and it was smoggy. It wasn't fog, it was smoggy. And I have a distinct remembrance of three things. Cobbled streets, which I had never seen. Gaslight, and we are talking 1959, and black rain. I can see it now running down the gutter and it was black. I remember ringing home and saying, you know, oh, it's awful, it's filthy, it's dirty. And you know what, Mum, they actually still wear clogs and shawls. And she said, they don't. I said, they do. I mean, it was, it was a huge culture shock. But then I, I know what changed my mind. I then did the pantomime. And of course, I was a lot younger then. And I was playing the sort of buttons, idol jack type. I can't remember even the pantomime. But I know I had to cajole the audience, and I've always loved sort of working with an audience. And I actually, they weren't singing or something, and I remember saying, oh, come on, sing. And this voice rang out, who does he think he is? He doesn't come from here. And I thought, oh, they're actually, you know, they want to communicate. And I stayed. I mean, I've been here on and off. I haven't been here ever since then, but I've stayed on and off. And that's because of the people of Oldham. Why don't you just do that? Yes, well, I've had enough as well, you know. 22 years of half of a double act, Flanagan and Allen. I'm sick to death of science. Kenneth Allen Taylor is very much a hands-on type of producer. And although he's perhaps still regarded as an incomer, despite the years he's been here, he has particular affection, not to say respect, for the audience. Do you know when my son was born and I had to sign the birth papers? Yes. You know when it says... Name of male parent? Yes. Well, I signed Flanagan and Allen. <laughs>
That's not bad, that bud. Not bad at all. If they like what you're doing, they are second to none as an audience. I've never heard laughs anywhere in England, and I've worked all over England, anywhere like Oldham. They, they're not inhibited. As long as they can relate to what's going on on stage, you know, they don't like farce. They don't like egg porn. Um, farce, one woman said to me, I remember we did a couple of farces years ago, and I said, did you like, no, it's too daft to laugh at that. And so they're wonderfully honest, and that's what I like about them. And, and once they do accept you, and it took them quite a while to accept me, I think, because I was a foreigner. Um, but once they accept you, I think you're there for life. Well, I, <laughs> I have been here for life, seemingly. There was a time when it was a job for life in the textile industry. Father followed son and so on. But the 60s saw a serious decline in Lancashire's fortunes. Mills were closing at the rate of one a month, and 12,000 mill workers a year lost their jobs. It was felt all the more deeply in an industry which had built up a sense of loyalty through generations of expertise and lifetimes of work. Stephen Hutchinson, like his father before him, always worked for the family-owned textile company Shiloh Spinners Limited. Well, it's a very family-orientated business. It's a very close-knit community. A lot of people here have worked a lot of years, with a number of people who've done 30, 40, 50 years. It's been the life, and it's been their parents' life. Apart from just the redundancy and the unemployment side of it, where the, there are very few mills to go to now, it has been people's lives, and it's a big chunk just cut dead for them. T.E. Tommy was the first guard side to become Shiloh's chairman. His son, Colonel J.B., followed, and today it's his son, Edmund, who heads up the company, in spite of his father's advice. Cotton gets into your blood, and People ask me, why did I come into Australia? I went to university and got a degree in law, but I just felt I wanted to come in, and my father did his best to persuade me to do something different because he could see that the industry was going to go into decline, but I just wanted to come in. And I think it, it gets in the blood. You like the people. I mean, they're wonderful people, the, what I call the Lancashire textile operative, marvellous sense of humour and uh, very loyal, very supportive, never been highly paid. They haven't, we haven't been able to afford them, to pay them, pay them well. But there's always there's a, there's a spirit in, in, in inside the mill, and it's, as I say, it's something you get in, into your bloodstream, and um, that is the way and why I think my family have wanted to continue to be involved. Elk Mill, of course, sadly has, uh, has closed. It's one of the last of the, the cotton mills uh, in the town to operate. And, uh, and I suppose brings us to the end of an era. Because cotton was the prosperity of Oldham. Great wealth. They used to say there, were, there was a mill for every day of the year. 365 in Oldham. When I was ready for leaving school, there wasn't much talk of going into, into the mill. Um, because there just wasn't enough mills around to sustain the school leavers. Um, so, I mean, I wasn't, certainly didn't have any intentions of going into a mill, I must admit. And I suppose a lot of that was from conversations overheard in the household, thinking, you know, sort of listening to mum and dad talking, and thinking, well, I don't fancy doing that, thank you very much. But, again, it was like, in those days was the miller, the cotton industry was the in thing. They didn't get the choices I have. And I suppose if I'm honest now there's there's even more choices um for for industries. We're due to get a, a big complex built in Oldham shortly, which is gonna have Temping Ball and Ellie, a cinema. Um I mean we haven't had a cinema in Oldham for a, a good fifteen years, I think. So we're gonna have a, a cinema back in Oldham, so at least you know, they can go and watch films again without getting on a bus. These are all things that were there 40 years previously, you know. Um, we used to have temping ball and alleys in cinemas when I was a child, and now, as I'm, as I'm older, we're getting them back again. So it's a new generation, you know, being brought up in. Today, there are few visible reminders of Oldham's industrial past, as civic leaders look to the future needs of a borough much changed and extended to include Chadderton, Failsworth, Lees, Royton, Shaw, Crompton and Saddleworth. 
But it's not just the landscape that's changed. The population has too, as brought into focus by the annual Streets Ahead Festival. Fifties, we, we, uh, we've had the uh, sort of influx of Ukrainians, and Polish people, and those communities. There were Afro-Caribbean communities, more recently Pakistani and uh, Bangladeshi communities. The, the cultural diversity is quite considerable within the town itself, and uh, these traditions have brought with them uh, interesting things and in colour to the life of the town itself. <laughs> Definitely not Afro-Caribbean, this is a restaurant run by three young Bangladeshi, right in the heart of one of the borough's Asian areas. But Spice Cafe was set up as a place where people could gather socially, something these new Oldhamers wanted to establish, which their parents didn't have. When we came, we saw our elders, fathers, uncles work mills, cottons, restaurants, then sleep and work. Not much any uh, social places to go. In their free times, all, what they could have done is like go to maybe a cinema or maybe a couple of friends' houses just for a walk in the market. Nothing much more than that. We tried to create a self-employment for ourselves first and then a different place where everybody comes and feel, oh yeah. It's cool. It's home. Yeah. They feel at home. The food we provide here is like Nothing special, but it's something different. It's entirely different from every other Indian restaurant. It is cooked in the s with the same spices, same everything. But we did research on few, about 15 odd dishes. Um, exactly the same sauces as served in Bangladesh. So when we opened, all the youngsters start, started coming in, you know, 13, 9 and everything, they started coming in. So it was good because we wanted them as well. So they started coming in. So what happens, till 9 o'clock, we have all these you know, 9, 10-year-olds coming in, having a done kebab. And then uh, we have uh, my age group who come when on there because they work part-time. So they come Sunday and spend their money here. And then we have the elders talking politics and eating away. If the Bangladeshi community wasn't happy in Oldham, there wouldn't have been a such big community. It's about 10,000 people within a two, two and a half mile radius. I've been here nearly 22, 23 years. Um, obviously we were here because our family is here. It's with the family. We went to school here, we went to the college here, we worked part time around here. So every time I worked outside this town, one thing I missed was Oldham. For the young Oldhamer, the door to the wider world is always open. Some will step through it, experience life and work away from here. Some will come back. And maybe some will never leave. I'm most interested in sports and music and we've got Oldham Lyceum that does a lot of music. Um, you can do choir there as well. Um, there's Oldham Netball Club. I was a member for a few years. I think that's very good. Um, there's the sports centre and that's very good for just going for the gym or swimming or anything like that. I think it's very good. So, In the area where I grew up, there's a lot of people, lots of families there, and the people I've grown up with from, from you know, from very, very, being very, very young. I'd miss my friends and family. Yeah, I'd miss my friends and family, but I'd also miss going watching the football, because I've seen the rise, the fall and the plummet. I want to stay around for the rise of Oldham again. Oldham folk are very warm, very immediate, very direct, a gaining in confidence, I think, because over the years we've had a rough time. Since the, since the cotton industry declined, uh, it's been rough. Uh, and it's, life has been tenuous, it's been a low wage area, economy's not been good. Now we're on the up. As you can see in the development of the town centre, there's a great confidence growing within the town, a great, a, a great deal more happiness, I think. 
and, and we're addressing the problems of, of, of poverty and deprivation uh, very vigorously, uh, both in the statutory and voluntary areas. So, old and folk are getting a bigger vision, a wider vision, and I think they're enjoying themselves a little bit more than they have done in recent years. I'll never leave it. Oldham's, Oldham Market's my life. I'll be there until I drop. I love this town. Anything I have, I owe to this town. I've been working in so many different places, but it was always Oldham that we missed. If you're a friend of someone in Oldham, you're a friend forever. And I, I wonder that, you know, it is like that. It's, it's, um, it's uh, something that's a forever thing. Mm -hmm.